What's up Ozones, welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another Missable Details video. Today we will be going through what I think is generally a pretty well received story in the FNAF community and that is the story of the man in room 1280. Now if you're wondering why the number 1280 was chosen for the room number, I genuinely don't have an answer for you. I'm not sure if there were any reasons in picking the number, even though in 1.35am Delilah and Harper talked about how every number had its own meaning, just like how 135 or 135 is Charlotte Emily's birthday in the novels. I think one uh, well, 1280 is a very even number. You're probably watching this video in 1280 by 720 right now. Anyway, my point is that I don't really have an answer for that, so if that's what you came here for, then I'm sorry. Today, however, we will be talking about everything that you missed in The Man in Room 1280, from Easter eggs and foreshadowing to game connections and a lot of Greek mythology. But before we get into all of that, I just want to invite you to my two Discord servers. The first is the Ozone, my own zone server, the place you can go zone to be less alone zone, and the second is a joint server with other FNAF YouTubers like Theft King and Underscore called Let's Fight About FNAF, or LeFaf FNAF for short. It's not very short for an acronym. Make sure that you join these in the description and also make sure that you subscribe. About 77% of my viewers aren't actually subscribed and funnily enough, that number means you're bringing new understanding into your life. Hey, that's funny because that's exactly what happens when you subscribe. Okay, I'll stop. We start with the nurse's perspective of the priest approaching the hospital and it seems like a very odd and not really needed scene for the story as a whole. But one thing that I would like to pick up on is this line saying they all breathed as shallowly as they could, trying to ignore the sensation of being observed and judged. It's a strange second line to the story, but one that just shows the level of intensity of paranoia that being in this room feels like. It feels really similar to the paranoia in many other stories. One that comes back to mind is 1.35am again, where Delilah becomes insane to the point where she's more scared of the future events than the present. But remember that the actual force behind that story and many others was revealed to be Eleanor, and the man in room 1280 was also included in in this roster. So it's possible that the strange feeling of being watched and being judged in this room could somehow be connected to Eleanor. We then meet Arthur in what I believe to be some incredible opening paragraphs. Almost everything that we learn about his faith and his personality is shown in his restored 1953 red bicycle called Ruby, obviously due to the gleaming colour. Um, apparently it was a gift from a dying man and it was a horrible display of the first deadly sin, which is pride. The state and the history of Ruby really shows Arthur's kindness, his loyalty and his faithfulness, which is otherwise told to us through his conversation with Peggy, his housekeeper, not the Skylar sister. She tells him that it's going to rain, to which he replies that the sun loiters behind every cloud. This starts the huge contrast of good versus evil which lurks throughout the entire story. The hospital seems to be a huge building with a large dump of connotations relating to Greek mythology. At the portico ceiling, there are some Cerberus statues. Cerberus is the multi-headed dog who serves for Hades, who is the god of the underworld. Now, his job was to guard the gates of the underworld so that the alive could never enter and the dead could never leave. I'd also like to point out that Hades would give bad people a really bad time. I'd imagine the torment that the bad people received in the underworld um, was similar to the torment that Afton received from, from the one he should not have killed in Ultimate Custom Night. So there's a parallel there. Additionally, the building is called Heracles Hospital. Now, Heracles was the son of Zeus and Alcmean, and the last of his 12 labors was to capture Cerberus. Apparently Cerberus was to be feared by any man and Heracles knew that there was a risk in not returning by entering the underworld. I think that Heracles' uh, 12th labour has huge parallels to this story and maybe, just maybe, it could explain the number 12 in the number 1280. Probably not. Also, I believe that this poster 
from Pizzeria Simulator could be a good representation of what the hospital looked like. It's definitely not perfect, but it also seems like a drawing with some writing at the top that I can't actually read properly. If this is meant to represent the same place, it's definitely not a coincidence that it is the poster that appears in the scrap trap image, much like how the puppet poster is shown in Lefties. Something I personally didn't pick up on the first few times reading this story is that the hospital was actually bought by a billionaire 10 years before, and it was renovated to have crisp white walls and black and white floor tiles. A floor that's very reminiscent of the old Freddy's locations. Knowing that Afton has been kept in this building for years, it is possible that this billionaire had something to do with him and maybe even had a pass with Fazbear Entertainment. I can't fully answer that now, but it is definitely a topic for a future conspiracy video. Now, Nurse Ackerman mentions how they took him off of life support, but he is still being held alive by something. But also the funny comment that he doesn't have any family. No, he quite literally doesn't. One of his sons was the victim of the Bite of 83, the other became a zombie and probably died in the fire, his daughter was killed by one of his own creations, and it sounds like his wife committed suicide before being able to witness any of this. As a result, they don't have any DNA of any of them, which is why it's understandable that they have no idea who the man is. The brain is hooked up to a hypnogram, which is a graph that represents a person's stages of sleep over time. There are four stages, and the fourth is called REM sleep, REM sleep, uh, or rapid eye movement. And this is the stage that nightmares occur in, and the stage that Afton is found to be in. Now at this point, Nurse Ackerman says he's having horrible nightmares with a creepy smile, really indicating that whatever is keeping Afton alive is doing it so that he can be tormented for his evil past. After the smile, the nurse is actually called to room 907. Now, 1280 plus 907 is equal to 2187, which is exactly two centuries after the bite of 87. I probably didn't need to include that, but it's funny. Arthur describes seven facts about the man. He was burnt to a crisp. He had what looked like skin. His organs were working. He had no face. He had a brain he had a blood flow, and he was alive against all odds. Now these are all the reasons that Arthur is actually somewhat astounded after calling this situation a miracle, while others call him the incarnation of evil. We then get to the point where they show off the strange brain scans of the man. They show off three images, a coronal, sagittal, and cross-sectional brain scan. If you imagine a three-dimensional space, a coronal scan is one in the XZ plane, showing the front and the back views. A sagittal is one in the YZ plane that shows the side. And a cross-sectional brain scan is the one of the, Z of the XY plane, which shows the top. I am messing up my letters. The nurse showed that from all three perpendicular planes of space, all of them give the same image of two electromagnetic signals in all four lobes of the brain. And as the nurse points out, the signals should have been coherent as there were no signs of tumours or brain damage. And of course, the brain scans aren't faulty because three different images were taken and they all showed off the same problem. From here, it's crystal clear that these two entities were what was keeping Afton alive and they were tormenting each other for control over the brain. Arthur then magically discovers a way to communicate with Afton. Afton draws out letters with his index finger and then reacts using the monitors to confirm or deny his queries. There's a moment where he mentions the word hell and the monitors beep like crazy. I think everything points to the inside of the hospital walls creating a parallel to the underworld just like in Greek mythology as we said and the story being the outside of Afton's head during his purgatory in Ultimate Custom Night. As Arthur leaves on his first day there's a lot of emphasis on the fact that he had been there all day without realising and it's here where I want to point out the nature of pathetic fallacy in the story when he first entered the building, the rain began to pour heavily. 
complementing the theme of evil and the fact that Arthur didn't really know what he was getting himself into. But when he left the building, it had cleared up, but it was now night time. Which, of course, is a time of darkness and a time of mystery. At this point, Arthur had made some discoveries uh, concerning the man, but he didn't know why or how, and he needed to figure out a way to help the man get him out of the hospital. On the last day, there wasn't a glimmer of light through the clouds, but Arthur wore full rain gear. That kind of shows the inevitability of evil, while Arthur thinks he's doing something good to like defend against the evil. Uh, attack it, more like. Um, the weather in any story is always a great way to foreshadow events or to simply emphasise a certain mood or emotion, and this story is definitely no exception to that. Mia heard the nurses talking about how they were planning to kill the man, and then she saw a small child with curly black hair, a toothy grin, and an alligator mask. After seeing the figure, she walked into room 1200 or 1200, coming across a man doing a crossword puzzle. He asks, what is another word for hell? Six letters starts with an S. Straight away, Mia responded with the word shades, not knowing why that was in her head. This is where I'm a little stumped, okay? Because I've looked everywhere and I can't find anywhere that says that the two words are synonymous. What I will say though is that the word shade is also used for shadows, just like the shadow that she just shot, uh, that she just saw, um, and could probably be used to describe hell. But it's not a great connection, really. The big point I do want to make about this, though, which I find really funny, is that the letters that were missing from the man's crossword spells out Hades, who, as I already mentioned, is the god of the underworld. The man then tells Mia that she's an angel, which of course is a whole, a whole contrast to literally everything else in this story. A simple thing to point out is the police actually conduct a search for information concerning the boy, uh, the boy Andrew, and they find out he isn't a missing child. Now, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but I personally believe that Andrew was a special case in terms of Afton's murders, which is why he is the one you should not have killed. Um, it's why the the he the one that he should not have killed in Ultimate Custom Night is a he, and it's also why in the story and in the Stitch Racing is he seems so angry and persistent to torment Afton. Arthur and Afton get to the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center, and they come across a large, open, and unguarded entrance gate. Now I think this is a large antithesis to the entrance to Heracles Hospital. It's a big contrast. It's possible that the hospital represents hell, as aforementioned, while this place could represent a more heavenly place, or I guess the afterlife for Afton. And remember that Arthur sees what he is doing as a good thing, just like how he sees the good in the bad at the hospital he ends up seeing the bad in the good at the distribution center and an attorney made him sign a load of papers, meaning all of it was technically his responsibility. And that really strengthens the horror in this ending. Now the last few lines of this story are what make it so perfect. Throughout the entire story, Arthur talked about the balance between good and evil and how there's good in every evil, and there's evil in every good, blah blah blah. It's only at the end, when the black blood is spilled everywhere, that Arthur is completely aware of the imbalance, and he knows that he has done something terribly wrong. And as we see in the Stitch Race Stingers, and the other stories, this is the one thing that begins it all. And that's all that I have for you today. <laughs> Tell me what your favorite details were in the comments below. Maybe others that I missed. I probably missed a lot. Tell me what 1280 means in the comments below. Also subscribe and tell me what other stories you'd like me to cover in the near future. Check out my other missable details videos on my channel. But I've been Ozone and I have to go Zone. I'll see you later. Goodbye.